Welcome to part 14 in this series on the feasts and their prophetic message. In this episode, I'm going to continue to speak about the Day of Atonement. In the previous episode, we introduced the subject of the Day of Atonement, but I want to look in this episode at the ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's important to note that this particular feast is one day. It starts on the evening of the ninth day of the seventh month, and then it ends on the evening of the tenth day of the seventh month. So it's, it's one day. Now, as discussed in the previous episode about the Day of Atonement, it is a time of the year when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the whole nation of Israel. So it was consecrating the tabernacle, the holy space of the Lord, and also the holy nation of the Lord. And that was the purpose of the Day of Atonement. But now we're looking at the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we know to be a thousand years. As the Apostle Peter writes, he says that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So if we look at the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus as the day of atonement for the nation of Israel, but also for the whole earth. And to understand that more fully, we need to look at God's overall purpose, the bigger picture. So let's take a quick look at that. The Bible starts with this magnificent garden, the Garden of Eden, which the Lord said he would plant in the east and that he would set the man and the woman in this garden. But it was a very, very special space. We're not given an awful lot of detail about this garden, but what we can say is that it was the place where heaven and earth were united and both God and the angels and humans were able to live together and interact in this garden. So it was a holy place on earth where the heavenly and the earthly realms came together. So it was unique, it was wonderful, it was glorious. And there was a tremendous blessing. In fact, so good that when God looked upon it, he said that it was very good. But of course, after the fall, God had to put Adam and Eve out of the garden. And then the whole message of the Bible then turns and the concentration is upon the human beings outside of the garden. But then we find later on in the very second book of the Bible that once again, God is wanting to live amongst his people. As we know, God made a covenant with Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And then the children of Jacob and the whole family of Jacob landed up in Egypt. And after a period of about 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. God then delivered them in the mighty Exodus, brought them out into the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and this is what we are told. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. So here is the purpose of God once again. This purpose was indicated in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They failed and now God has called out this nation, the Jewish nation, and they were going to be his treasured possession. And God's intention then was to interact with them. And so this is what we are told. Although the whole earth is mine, says the Lord, you will be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now this is the really important issue if we are to understand the Day of Atonement during the millennium because God was going to come down upon the mountain. But remember the earth had been corrupted by man's sin. Here is a holy God coming down on a corrupted earth to interact with sinful people. And that was the big issue. And so this is what we're told. God told Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain 
shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him. So the person who's touched the mountain, no one must touch him. But he shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. But having washed themselves and consecrated themselves, because this is a very holy space. It is not the Garden of Eden, but it is the Holy God coming down onto a corrupt earth. So after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them. That was important. And they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations, obviously between husband and wife. Not that that was a wrong thing, but in order to be pure, to meet with the Lord. So to, to not indulge in the normal earthly practices, even though they were not sinful, but to remain pure before the Lord and come before him as clean and as pure as they possibly could. Now that helps us to understand also the 613 laws that the Lord gave to the children of Israel. And many of them were hygiene laws, how they were to clean themselves, how they were to not touch dead bodies. And if they did, they were unclean until the evening. Then they had to wash themselves, wash their clothes and all of those uh, many, many things that he told them to do. The laws also involved the way they were to live together in harmony as a nation so that they could be an example nation, unique from all the other nations, but be a representation of the Almighty God, His purity and His glory to the other nations, just as was the intention with Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve failed, and now God was calling out this nation Israel to do the very same thing, to be in fellowship with Him and be an example to the other nations. So not only did the Lord come down onto Mount Sinai, but He told Moses that He was to prepare a place for him because He wanted to come and live amongst the children of Israel. This is what he said. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them, just as he had done in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And of course the pattern came from the tabernacle that is in the heavenly realm. Now what is very interesting about this tabernacle is that not only does it represent the tabernacle in the heavenly realm, but it also is a model of the Garden of Eden. So it represents the Garden of Eden. So it's this holy space that God wanted the children of Israel to have right in the middle of their camp so that God could live amongst them. So if you look into the holy place, you'll see the tree of life in the form of the seven branch golden candlestick. You'll also see the bread the bread of life which God provides for them, which God did provide for Adam and Eve in the garden. There was an abundance of food. And then the altar of incense, which is what Adam and Eve should have been doing, worshipping God in the Garden of Eden. And then on the curtains and around about there are cherubim and angels and so on. So this represents heaven and earth come together, but now not in the Garden of Eden, but in this holy space in the tabernacle. Now let's turn our attention to the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. In the book of Revelation we read, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Now remember in the beginning of Revelation, those letters to the churches, to the Laodicean church, the Lord said, if you overcome, he that overcomes will sit with me in my throne judging over the nations. So this is a reference to resurrected saints that have been given this authority and responsibility. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life, in other words the resurrection, and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now let's look at a summary of a number of the things that have to be accomplished once Jesus arrives on earth. Because remember, the earth is in an absolute mess 
when he arrives. So there's a lot to be done. And we may have the impression, if we have just been reading the New Testament, for instance, Revelation chapter 19, Jesus arrives and it seems that he almost waves a magic wand and everything becomes perfect. But that is not the case as we look very carefully at what the prophets have to say. So let me just put in an itemized form certain of the things that need to be done just to get an idea of the work that Jesus has ahead of him at his second coming. Now these are not necessarily in the correct order, but these are the items that uh, the scripture speaks about. Jesus and his mighty army, Joel talks about this, will have to defeat the enemies of Israel as they march towards Jerusalem from the south, very likely from Egypt, Mount Sinai, through the wilderness, the same route of the Exodus, but arriving eventually in Jerusalem. Then the battle of Armageddon, because remember the Antichrist has set himself up at Jerusalem. And remember the Antichrist has drawn the nations of the world together to resist and stand against Jesus Christ. The gathering of Jews from all corners of the earth to the Holy Land. The Lord said he will gather them back, bring them back from exile and wherever they've been, he will draw them back to the Holy Land. Then salvation of the nation of Israel. Their eyes will be opened. They'll look upon him whom they have pierced. They'll ask him, where did you receive those wounds? He will say, in the house of my friends. And just like Paul on the Damascus road, their eyes will be opened and they'll recognize that Jesus is their Messiah who was crucified, buried and rose again 2,000 years ago. So that great recognition will then dawn upon the whole nation of Israel. As Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11, he says, Then all Israel will be saved. Then there will be the burying of all the dead bodies. There will, the whole land will be strewn with the enemies of Israel that have been killed by the second coming of Jesus, the sword that goes out of his mouth. Then there will be the burning of all the weapons of war and converting them to farming instruments. Isaiah tells us that they will turn their spears and their shields and their swords into pruning hooks. And there are various other references to this as we will see. The purifying of Mount Zion and Jerusalem as the holy space for Jesus to occupy and from which he will rule the world. Now remember, he's come into a corrupt world. He is surrounded by sinners. So very much like God coming down onto Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai could not be touched because it was a holy space. Now likewise, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, will be purified and it will be a holy space for Jesus and those that rule and reign with him. Another very important responsibility that Paul tells us about in 1 Corinthians 15 that rests upon the shoulders of the Lord Jesus is this. He says, For he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Remember Jesus conquered death when he rose from the dead, but now he's got to conquer death for all of those who belong to him. So let's recall that the nation of Israel that have been saved at his second coming, because their eyes have been opened to recognize that he is their Messiah, they're still in their mortal bodies. So death has still got to be conquered for them, and they need to be resurrected at that final judgment. This is the last enemy that Jesus has to deal with, and he does this at the end of the thousand year reign. Now let me just touch on a few passages that paint the picture for us to understand this glorious millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. He says, I will make known my holy name among my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned. And the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One in Israel. He's going to use Israel to be a light to the other nations. It is coming... It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. So while in a certain sense the thousand year period is the day of atonement because the whole earth is being cleaned up, sanctified, Israel is being saved, they're reaching out to the other nations to bring them before the Lord so that they too can be saved. And we know that not everyone is saved because the devil is released at the end of the thousand year period to test the nations and many of them fail. But this is a time 
of atonement for the whole world. Now this passage in Ezekiel just gives us an indication of the amount of time that is required to do this cleanup process. Then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel and burn them up. This is after the destruction of the Antichrist, after the battle of Armageddon. And small and large shields and bows and arrows and war clubs and spears. For seven years they will use them for fuel. They will not need to gather wood from the fields or to cut from the forests because they will use the weapons for fuel. And they will plunder those who plundered them and loot those who looted them, declares the Sovereign Lord. So this is the whole cleanup process. As I've already mentioned, Isaiah talks about turning their shields and their spears into pruning hooks, a similar thought. We're also then told that there'll be so many dead bodies that it's going to take a long time to bury all the dead of the Antichrist and his armies that have come against the Lord. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them and the day I am glorified will be a memorable day for them, declares the Sovereign Lord. Men will be regularly employed to cleanse the land. Some will go throughout the land and in addition to them, others will bury those that remain on the ground. At the end of the seven months, they will begin their search. So they'll go back again and, and search the whole area. As they go through the land and one of them sees a human bone, he will set up a marker beside it until the grave diggers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. That's the place where the Antichrist and his armies will be buried in this particular area. So it's cleansing the land. Now remember... During the time in the wilderness when Moses gave the 613 laws, one of the laws was not to touch dead bodies. So dead bodies defile the land. So this cleansing process is absolutely necessary and it's going to take quite a bit of time to clean up the whole place so that the area that is occupied by the Lord is a holy area, sanctified and is set apart for his use from, from which he will rule and reign over the whole earth. Now, of course, this area, the Temple Mount, also needs a lot of cleansing. There is this abomination, there is the mosque, the al Aska Mosque, and then the Dome of the Rock, all of which will have to be removed. It is an abomination to the Lord and the whole place sanctified and prepared for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then we're told, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. The whole land from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, will become like the Arabah. In other words, it will be desolate. But Jerusalem will be raised up and remain in its place. From the Benjamin gate to the site of the first gate, to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the royal wine press. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house. It will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. So the whole of Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the whole area that the Lord will occupy is going to be holy to the Lord, completely sanctified, because as I've said, it is surrounded by people in mortal bodies, the nation of Israel, saved but still in mortal bodies, and then the other nations which will come before the Lord to bow before him, as we're told, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But they're still in their mortal bodies, and therefore they are a defilement. This whole area will be holy like Mount Sinai was back in the wilderness. So getting back to the Day of Atonement and its ultimate fulfillment, so as I've said, the thousand year period, the reign of Jesus, is in a certain sense the day of atonement for the whole world and all the nations of the world. But more specifically, there will be the wedding feast of the Lamb and the gathering of the saints at Jerusalem. And this will be a very special day. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. 
And as I did say in a previous episode, the canopy is a wedding canopy. It is set over the whole of Jerusalem because this is the wedding feast of the Lamb. It will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and rain. So let me conclude with this. In that day, so it's a specific day, the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt. That's the whole land that God originally promised to Abraham. He's taken back. And you, O Israelites, will be gathered up one by one. And in that day, a great trumpet will sound. So this is the Day of Atonement. And normally, on the Day of Atonement, as I've said in previous episodes, no trumpet is actually sound, except when it coincides with the year of jubilee and so this is the ultimate year of jubilee when the land is restored to its original owners as god promised and the slaves are set free and those who were perishing in assyria and those who were exiled in egypt will come and worship the lord on the holy mountain in jerusalem now, the resurrected saints will be there because they're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. The saved nation of Israel will be there to worship the Lord. What a mighty gathering that will be. And the singing and rejoicing will be beyond our imagination. As Paul put it, this will be a time of exceeding joy. May God bless you as you ponder these things. And Maranatha.